on this week's episode, the high rolling kingpin Jewish bookies of the Boston mob. Welcome back, everyone. On this week's episode, we'll discuss some legendary bookies from the Boston underworld. When people think about organized crime in the hub, Jewish people are probably the last image that comes to most people's minds. But as we'll discuss, some of the biggest bookies in the Boston area were Jewish. From the early days in the Old West End when they operated independently, till the end of the 20th century when they were being squeezed more and more by the North End and South Boston, names like Jimmy Katz, Zimmy Zimmerman, Chico Krantz, Mikey the Bank at London rang bells in the Boston streets. These guys were some of the biggest bookmakers in the city, and in the case of Harry Doc Jasper Sagansky, the entire country. These men would make millions of dollars untaxed and illegal over the course of decades, but lacking any real muscle, many of these aging kingpins couldn't withstand all the pressure from the government and younger, hungrier criminals. During their twilight years, their choices were grim. Pay up or cooperate with the law. Now, if you've watched my channel in the past, you know I'm never going to skip an opportunity for a brief history lesson. So, like I said, although not a group that first comes to mind when you think about Boston, there's still a sizable Jewish population in the city. The Irish might have been Boston's largest ethnic group through the 19th and 20th century, but the city has been more mixed than most people think. Some of the very first Jewish residents that came here were even before the Irish. Around 1840, Jewish people from Germany slowly began to immigrate to the United States, Germany being one of the first European groups after the English to settle in America. This first group of Jewish people settled around the Theater District and Park Square area of Boston. This is a relatively small amount of people comparatively though. And then in the 1850s through the 1870s, there was a mass influx of Irish escaping the dreaded potato famine in Ireland. This was Boston's first large immigrant population. The Irish first settled in the cramped and dingy North End neighborhood, and this became the first stop for all new immigrant groups arriving in the city. After the Irish, who classed with the ruling Brahmin class of Boston, began to move out into other neighborhoods such as Charlestown, South Boston, a second, much larger wave of Jewish immigrants arrived in Boston. This time they hailed from Eastern Europe, primarily Poland, the Ukraine, and Russia. They were fleeing religious persecution and failing economies. So like the Irish before them, the freshly arrived Eastern European Jewish people settled in the North End Ghetto, which at this time was unsanitary cramped tenements sandwiched between a busy, dirty waterfront and an industrial wasteland. Not exactly what you would call desirable living. So again, like the Irish before them, the Jewish population began fleeing the North End for greener pastures, which at the turn of the 20th century was the neighboring West End neighborhood. Apparently there used to be a pond called Mill Pond in between the North End and the West End. In colonial times, the West End was mostly farm and pasture land, but throughout the 1800s, with Boston's population growing, they filled in the Mill Pond to accommodate the growing West End neighborhood. In 1893, North Station was built, which is in the middle of the West End, and it brought many jobs to the neighborhood. By the turn of the 20th century, the West End had become the heart of Jewish Boston. In a 1910 census, there was roughly 40,000 Jewish residents living in Boston's West End, making them one of Boston's biggest populations. Leonard Nimoy, a.k.a. Dr. Spock from Star Trek, is a proud resident of Boston's West End. He even named one of his boats the West Ender later in life. What a guy. Alright, well now that I've established a basic history of Boston's Jewish population, what about the Jewish people in Boston's underworld? While in other cities like New York where Jewish criminals controlled a huge piece of the underworld in the first half of the 20th century, Boston was not so. There wasn't one criminal entity controlling the whole city of Boston in the early 1900s. There really wasn't any type of organized crime, so to speak, at all. You had small neighborhood groups that controlled the areas that their own ethnic groups lived in. It was mostly very low-level gambling, loan shocking, extortion rackets. Groups like the Italian Black Hand, the precursor to the Mafia, who extort local Italian vendors, who mistrusting of the American establishment would not go to the authorities. It wasn't until Prohibition that crime began to become more organized in the city of Boston. 
The enormous amount of money that was being made through the illegal manufacturing and sale of alcohol during the 1920s transformed the American underworld. Soon, two-bit hoods like Al Capone and Lucky Luciano became extremely rich and powerful men. So rich and powerful that they were able to corrupt almost every level of law enforcement and government for that matter as well. In Boston, one man that rose to the top of the rackets during Prohibition was none other than Charles King Solomon. Solomon was born in Russia to Jewish parents and immigrated to the United States as a child. He grew up in the North Shore city of Salem before residing in the Jewish stronghold of the West End in Boston. Solomon quietly amassed a fortune in a criminal empire. Although a kingpin bootlegger, Solomon was one of America's first large-scale narcotics traffickers and also was said to operate brothels. But the majority of Solomon's vast wealth was accumulated through the violation of the Volstead Act. It was said that Solomon owned his own rum factory in Central America and his own fleet of speedboats to transport the liquor up and down the east coast of Boston. By doing this, Solomon completely cut out the middleman and amassed an eye-popping amounts of wealth. But Solomon should have retired while he was on top, but like most racketeers, he enjoyed the fast life too much. After closing his Coconut Grove Club on the night of January 24th, 1933, he and some of his employees and club patrons took a cab to the Hopping Cotton Club on Tremont Street to continue the party. Around 3 a.m. while in the bathroom, Solomon was cornered by some Irish and Greek thugs. He was heard from outside the bathroom saying, You's got my bankroll, what else do you just want? Then another voice saying, You had this coming a long time, followed by several bangs and people running from the bathroom to the exit. A moment later, Solomon stumbled from the bathroom, clutching his stomach. The dirty rats got me, he said before collapsing on the floor, taking his last breath. After prohibition with the death of Charles King Solomon and the masterful ambush by mafioso chieftain Joe Lombardo against the South Boston Gustins, it would seem that the Italian Cosa Nostra was the most dominant faction in the city. But for the most part, the different criminal groups in the city just stuck to their own ethnic neighborhoods. By the 1950s, though, a couple Jewish bookies were making such incredible amounts of money that other criminals started to take notice. Harry Doc Jasper Sagansky was born right at the turn of the 20th century in 1898 and grew up right in the heart of the old Jewish West End in its heyday. Raised by working-class Jewish immigrants, Sagansky was very intelligent and excelled at academics. Encouraged by his parents, he went on to graduate from Tufts University with a dentistry degree. He set up his practice in, of all places, the old Scully Square, I mean, it's nearby to the neighborhood he grew up in. Scully Square is where Boston City Hall Plaza is now located. You know where that nitwit cop was filmed almost ending his life on that high-powered children's slide? The close proximity to his neighborhood makes sense, but Scully Square was Boston's first red-light district. Kind of an odd choice for a dentist office. I don't know, just, just me maybe? Some people might disagree with me saying that Scully Square was a red light district, but before the combat zone exists, Scully Square was where people went for adult entertainment and burlesque shows and whatnot. It was nothing as bad as the combat zone, but I should make a video about Scully Square, its own video, because it's like it's a lost piece of Boston history that a lot of people might not know about. But Sagansky, who seemed to be on the surface to be living a successful, legitimate life, he married a local woman named Molly and they moved out to the nice western suburb of Brookline. By the 1950s, the more successful Jewish Bostonians were moving to the suburbs. Jewish families that wanted to leave the cramped West End tenements began buying property along Blue Hill Ave through Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. It's interesting that this area is now considered the heart of Black Boston, but it used to be a Jewish mainstay before the white flight of the 1960s. Besides the West End, many Jewish families wound up in Lynn and Chelsea working in factories there. I never knew this, but by the 1930s, half of Chelsea's population was Jewish and was being referred to as the Jerusalem of America. Now it's known for its huge Central American population. But like I said, by the late 1950s, most of the successful, prosperous Jewish Bostonians moved to the suburbs like Brookline and Newton in the West and Swampscott on the North Shore. Even though Sagansky had a legitimate occupation as a dentist, it seems like to some extent he was always involved in illegal gambling. Starting in 1919 and in 1923, he was arrested for gambling on the Lord's Day of all things, which resulted in a $3 fine, and he got arrested again in 1927 for illegal betting. But by the 1930s, Doc, as he went by on the street, was amassing enough illegal money to start investing in legitimate enterprises. Some of these legitimate enterprises were famous Boston nightclubs, the Mayfair, which opened in 1934, and the Latin Quarter, which opened in 1943. It's also rumored that Sagansky gave Mickey Redstone his initial capital to buy his first drive-in movie theater on Long Island, New York. Redstone would go on to create a multi-billion, that's B, billion with a B dollar movie theater empire. 
As Sagansky got deeper and deeper into the world of illegal gambling, he practiced dentistry less and less. He still kept the moniker of Doc Jasper so as not to divulge his true identity on the streets while plying his trade. He was arrested in 1931 for promoting the lottery and in 1943 as part of what the government called a $90 million gambling ring along with 22 other men. But it was when Sagansky tried to bribe a Malden alderman to permit, permit a game of Bino, which is basically bingo that my yaya used to play at the Peabody Senior Center, Sagansky got two and a half years in jail. Can you imagine a bunch of cops like, coming to a senior center and breaking up a Bino game and filling up a paddy wagon with a bunch of blue-haired old ladies for playing bingo on a Sunday night? Jesus, Massachusetts is effed. That's just the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for you, baby. By the 1950s, Doc Jasper Sagansky was truly a bookie kingpin. When the Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver began touring the country and subpoenaing all types of underworld figures to testify in front of his committee, Doc was in his crosshairs. Kefauver labeled Sagansky as one of the top 150 bookmakers in the entire United States. Apparently, his personal bank account showed over $3 million in deposits, which for the 1950s was astronomical. Also in 1953, Attorney General George Fingold found that Sagansky had on-duty Boston police officers guarding his gambling headquarters so nobody would rob him. That's some juice, baby. Sagansky had deep law enforcement and political connections in Boston. He even made a personal loan to former infamous mayor James Michael Curley, who himself had been incarcerated, for the sum of $8,500. For collateral, Sagansky took out a life insurance policy on Curley and had him make Sagansky the beneficiary. Also, most likely an attempt to make himself look good to the public or just for good karma, in the 1950s, Sagansky made one of the largest contributions to Tufts Dental School up until that point. Sagansky was a kingpin at this point, no doubt. But in the North End, Jerry Angulo, a prominent bookie himself, was beginning to expand his power base. By the end of the 1950s, the Italian Cosa Nostra was reaching the zenith of its power in Boston. Jerry Angiulo, who lacked any real muscle but had a great mind for business, bought his way into the Borgata. Now with the blessing of the Don Raymond Patriarca and the backing of tough street thugs like Larry Bayonne, Angiulo began to squeeze independent Jewish bookies. Angiulo and his brothers ran a very successful bookmaking operation out of the North End themselves, but they weren't satisfied with that. And without any enforcers, the Jewish mobsters were basically easy prey for the LCN. The Jewish mobsters of Boston were not like their brethren in the lower east side of Manhattan or in Brooklyn. During Prohibition in the 1930s, racketeers like Bugsy Siegel, Lepke Bolkhalter, Meyer Lansky, Arthur Flegenheimer, aka Dutch Schultz, were just as powerful and feared as any Italian mobsters. They were actually a crew of Jewish thugs that did a lot of the mafia's dirty work during this time period. They were some of the most dangerous and deadly criminals in the New York underworld. But in Boston, that was not the case. The Jewish mobsters here were involved in bookmaking, loan shocking, and the numbers, aka the illegal lottery. They preferred to make money and avoid violence at any possibility. But that's not to say that once in a while, Jewish hoods didn't challenge Cosa Nostra in Boston. In 1953, a West End native named Morris Whitey Horowitz decided to start knocking off protected dice games in the North End. Now, I've never personally understood why guys would knock off protected games in the North End. It just seems like a surefire way to get yourself whacked. I assume it has to be some sort of bravado thing, like anyone can stick up a dice game, but to rob a protected dice game in the North End takes some serious balls and maybe not a whole lot of brains either. But either way, Whitey Horowitz was a tough guy with a fearsome reputation on the streets. He was a tough West Ender who grew up brawling on the streets and as a young man he boxed professionally before retiring to a life of criminality. Whitey had his own small bookmaking and loan shocking operation, but mostly he was a strong arm man. Other bookies and loan shocks would sick Horowitz on derelict customers, and for whatever reason Whitey decided to start holding up the dice games, he didn't even try to disguise his appearance. Of course, Jerry Angiulo couldn't let this type of disrespect go unchecked. So one night in January 1953, Horowitz walked up to a car idling in front of his Brookline home. Apparently, he leaned into the car and was killed by an unknown assailant. Later, Spex O'Keefe from the infamous Brinks robbery would say from prison that the maniacal trigger man, Elmer Trigger Burke, did it. I don't know what his reasoning for saying that was, but he made the claim.
Another big time Jewish bookie that was found dead in the 1950s, most likely at the hands of the boss in LCN, was Harold Zimmy Zimmerman. Zimmerman was a prominent bookie in the city and apparently quite the ladies' man. When the police searched his car after finding his body slumped over, they found an address book with over 100 women in it. At first, the police thought it might have been a lover's quarrel, a jealous woman perhaps, but they didn't think a woman would commit a crime in that way. On further investigation, they found that Zimmerman had been welching on large bets and was ducking the people he owed. The North End, feeling their power increasing, weren't about to let anyone slide. So just as Hurwitz before him, Zimmy Zimmerman was either set up or led to his death by someone. Authorities found him dead in his car parked in the Fenway behind the Museum of Fine Arts. Authorities said he had been deceased for nearly two days. By the end of the 1960s, with the charlestown somerville conflict that engulfed the whole city over with, the Italian Mafia ended up on top when the dust settled. From here on out, the Jewish bookies of the Boston mob would have to pay someone for the right to operate on the streets and in the underworld. That brings us to the infamous Hellas Cafe in the lovely city of Chelsea, Massachusetts. Just north of the city across the Mystic River sat the Jerusalem of America, as it was once called. Now they call it Chel Salvador. But Hellas Cafe was a beehive of illegal gambling activity. Some of the biggest Jewish bookies used this nondescript location as their base of operations. Men like Mikey the Bank of London, one of Boston's biggest bookies, London also went by the aliases Checkman or Checkers for the fact that he ran a huge check cashing business. It was also a very convenient way to launder his ill-gotten gambling gains. He also used this as a business opportunity and washed up to a half a million dollars of illegal money a week for various Italian and Irish criminals throughout the city. Also legendary bookie Bert Chico Krantz operated out of Hellas Cafe booking over a million dollars of bets a week during the 70s and 80s over the phone and in person at Hellas. This guy was a money making machine and apparently another way he earned some extra money on the side was working as a paid federal informant but that wouldn't come out until later. Other notable bookies that operated out of Hellas were Jimmy Katz and Eddie Lewis. These guys made some serious dough back in the day. Unfortunately, by the late 1980s for these aging Jewish bookie kingpins, money was becoming harder and harder for young mafioso and Irish thugs to come up with by themselves, so they began to target the aging bookies. Let's face it, like I said, these guys had no enforcement wings, so they were easy prey for the mafia and guys like Whitey and Steve Flemmy. So basically after Flemmy drew up a diagram for Jerry and Julo's doghouse let the FBI successfully plant a bug and arrest and convict the top tier of the Boston Mafia, Bulger and Flemmy were now going around trying to pick off unprotected bookies. They knew that the younger mafioso was scrambling trying to pick up the pieces after Angiulo and Bayonne went away and Ray and Patriarca passed. Also, the feds were all over the Italian guys. During the 1980s, it seemed like the FBI wasn't willing to investigate anyone that didn't have a vowel at the end of their name. This was making it almost impossible for the North End guys to earn. But they had the same idea that Whitey and Stevie did. They saw these old bookies as easy targets. One especially big fish that these guys wanted was the legendary Harry Doc Jasper Sagansky, who by the 1980s was in his 80s. But even as a youngster, Doc was a thinker and not a fighter. So a group of younger mafioso from the North End called for Sagansky and his partner, the miniature Morris Moe Weinstein. The two were called to Vanessa's at the Prudential Mall, which happened to be owned by none other than made man Angelo Sonny Macario, the same man that would later be responsible for helping the feds record the first ever mafia induction ceremony. Tipped off about the meeting by Flemmy, the feds bugged Vanessa's for sound. They heard younger feared mafioso threatening the older Sagansky and telling them they wanted $500,000 cash. Sagansky tried to negotiate by offering to sell his numbers business to the LCN, but they were not interested. Sagansky, frustrated, said that the government made the lottery legal. How much money do you think I make, kid? To which apparently Mr. Ferrara shrugged. Unmoved, he still wanted the money. At least that's what the feds allege anyhow. I wasn't there and I didn't hear the recording. Either way, Doc went and collected the money while his friend Mo had to stay and keep the North End guys company, you know, for collateral. Sagansky returned with the money and Weinstein was released unharmed. But the government was able to start to build a strong case against the North End guys and this would eventually help push Makiro into becoming a top echelon FBI informant. So this is exactly how Whitey and Stevie chiseled their way to the top. Instead of taking on the Italian Mafia head on, they would take them apart piece by piece using the FBI as their weapon. Then they would pick off the low-hanging fruit that was left behind. 
and that low-hanging fruit with the Jewish bookies that hung out at Hella's Cafe. When Cadillac Frank Salemi came out of prison in 1987 with the blessing from Ray Jr., he set forth to try to consolidate his power in the Boston area. Stevie and Whitey aligned themselves with Frank's regime and put him onto the bookies at Hella's, which were ripe for extortion. This is apparently what escalated the tensions between Salemi and the J.R. Russo Ferrara Bobby Carosa faction, who were also eyeing these Jewish bookies as prey for extortion. Basically, by the late 1980s, all the old rules had been thrown out the window, and these bookies who had a lot of money but no muscle were not safe anymore to these hungrier hoods. There was no Raymond Patriarca or Jerry Angelo keeping the order. And with it being harder and harder for the mafia to earn, they wanted these bookies' money. This is what ultimately led to Frank Salami being set up in the Saugus IHOP parking lot in 1989 and led to the outbreak of the 1990s Mafia War. Yes, it's Salami, not Salami, I know. It must be said that big props to Harry Doc Jasper Saganski, because in 1988, at the age of 91, Doc was called in front of a grand jury to talk about the events of Vanessa's and the alleged extortion. He refused to testify in front of the grand jury and was sentenced to 10 months in jail for contempt of court. He was the oldest organized crime figure to ever serve time in prison. While Harry Doc Jasper Sagansky was no tough street hoodlum, he certainly had more heart than most. He died a free man on January 28, 1997 at the age of 99. An absolute Boston legend. Give this guy his props. Unfortunate for Whitey and Stevie and Cadillac Frank, not all the other Jewish bookies of Boston were the same. After being thwarted at every turn first with the state police and then the DEA, the government was trying a new tact by pressing these aging bookies into turning on these dreaded mobsters. At first it didn't work, most of these guys would rather do a little time than most certainly being killed and disappearing at the hands of Stevie and Whitey. But after they kept losing money and kept getting locked up for contempt, their attitude started to change and it began with Bert Chico Krantz. By the mid-90s, Whitey and Stevie knew from retired FBI agent John Conley that indictments were coming soon. Whitey took this more serious than Stevie, traveling extensively and spreading money around safe deposit boxes with fake names. But they knew that authorities were leaning hard on these bookies to turn on them. North Shore bookie Charlie Razzo was talking to by Johnny Moderano, and he assured him that he would keep quiet. Tommy Ryan apparently didn't need to be talked to. Everyone knew he would stand up, no question. They worried a little bit about Newton-based bookie Joe Girardi, who went on the land because of legal troubles, but he was Moderano's boy, and Johnny assured Stevie and Whitey that he was all good. They were all worried a little bit about South Shore bookie Dick O'Brien. Though he was doing 18 months already for contempt of court, they were worried about what he would say when he went back in front of the judge after his 18 months was up. Flemmy got word to O'Brien, he told him to blame it on George Kaufman. George Kaufman, the crew's old member and resident car mechanic, was there linked to the Jewish bookies at Hella's Cafe in Chelsea. And since he was now deceased, Flemmy didn't think that he would mind eating charges for the crew. So the crew thought they had all their T's crossed and all their I's dotted, but like I said, Bert Chico Krantz, the multi-million dollar bookie, who was also a paid FBI informant that Flemmy outed him as an informant, but it was too late. Seeing the opportunity, other bookies jumped ship and began to cooperate. Knowing the indictments were coming, Whitey took off only to get caught in Santa Monica in 2013. Cadillac Frank fled to West Palm Beach only to get caught a few months later. Steve Flemmy didn't even leave the city but still seemed shocked at his arrest by federal agents. Hey, don't I work for you guys? But this was 1995 and it was certainly the end of an era in the Boston underworld. The big-time Jewish kingpin bookies of Boston, who were being squeezed by Irish and Italian thugs, were now finally put out of business by state and federal government. The legalization first of the lottery killed the numbers racket, but now with the legalization of sports betting and casinos in the state, illegal gambling is done. Just like with every other black market money maker, the government legalizes it, taxes it, and takes out all the competition. They want it all for themselves. Wake up, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video about the Jewish bookies of Boston. I think it was Jack Smith. He's got for his like profile picture uh, Don Johnson from Miami Vice. I think it was Jack Smith. But someone requested this a while back. Uh, I had trouble finding time to make this video. I've been digging every day and hanging out with my kids. And oh yeah, I had a birthday this week. Uh, so if you guys want to throw me a super thanks, 
feel free. No worries though, no hard feelings. But if you guys like this video, you can do this for me. You can hit that like button. You can subscribe if you're not already subscribed. But most importantly, people, non-negotiable, this part, make good decisions, good choices, take good care of yourselves, your family, your loved ones, your fellow human beings. Try to have a great day. I'll talk to you guys soon. God bless.